All right, guys, we are in Psalm 42 and 43 tonight. I know y'all got kids swimming in your laps, but I am going to try to ask you questions tonight. Uh, this is a really good psalm to, um, to learn on, um, learn about the flow of the text, uh, make some comparisons uh, within the psalm, see the progress. There's a couple of different places where the progress in the psalm, the spiritual progress is really amazing. And so he describes it with his words. So this is a fun one just to sit and look at and notice relationships from the first section to the second section, first section to the third section because it's really short. You can, show, you can see relationships between one verse and the next verse. You can see relationships between first verse and the last verse of the same section. So, again, this is a really good one to just sit and practice on. But I've told you this before. Um, it's easy to preach on things that you've experienced personally, the text, if that makes sense. But this is a lament and the writer, whoever he may be, most guys suggest it's David. We have no idea. The lament is so difficult. His experience is so difficult. I don't have anything in my life to relate. I've never reached the depth of sorrow that this particular writer is at. And so I'm preaching from a position that I don't normally, I'm not comfortable preaching, I'll just be honest with you. And a lot of these things, I don't know what he's talking about just because of the depth that he's at. Uh, I'll point it out as we go. It seems as though he's in captivity. Uh, but if he's in captivity, then David can't be the writer. The only way David could be the writer in Psalm 42 and 43 is if it's not captivity, but David's running from Saul. That would be the only point in David's life. But to me... I mean, if that's that perspective, then okay, this doesn't go as deep as I think in the lament. But the words are so deep in the lament. I just, to me, I just can't imagine this is David. But anyway, you'll see it as I read through it. Uh, 42 and 43 originally were together. And you'll see it when I read it because it always closes on the same refrain. Verse 5 um, why are you in despair, O my soul? Why have you become disturbed within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise Him for the help of His presence. That's repeated in verse 11. That's repeated in verse 5. Okay? So there is tremendous amount of structure here. Uh, the first section is a lament that moves us from verse 0, if you will, down to verse 4, and then you have the refrain in verse 5. The second lament, and again, there's progress in between the two laments, moves us from verse 6 all the way to verse 10. You have the re refrain in verse 11. You see that? And then you have the third lament, starts in 43.1, goes down to verse 4. Then you have the repeating refrain in verse 5. So originally these were together. Uh, don't really know why they were at some point separated, uh, but they were but we'll consider them as the same experience, the same writer, talking about the same thing. And I don't think there's any danger in that. Uh, there's just way too many connections going on between 42 and 43. Okay? So let me read it, and we'll pray and ask the Lord for help in understanding it. And then we'll get started walking through it. First verse, verse zero, if you will, for the choir director of Maskeel of the Sons of Korah. And that word literally means an instruction. Okay. As the deer pants for the water brooks, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night, while they say to me all day long, Where is your God? These things I remember, and I pour out my soul within me. For I used to go along with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God with the voice of joy and thanksgiving, a multitude-keeping festival. 
Why are you in despair, O my soul? Why have you become disturbed within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise Him for the help of His presence. O my God, my soul is despair within me, is in despair within me. Therefore, I remember you from the land of the Jordan and the peaks of Hermon and from Mount Mizar. Deep calls to deep at the sound of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your waves have rolled over me. The Lord will command. Actually, it's in a present tense. The Lord commands his loving kindness in the daytime and his song will be with me in the night. A prayer to the God of my life. I will say to my God, or, or I will say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As a shattering of my bones, my adversaries revile me, while they say to me all day long, where is your God? Why are you in despair, O my soul? Why have you become disturbed within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him. The help of my countenance and my God. Vindicate me, O God. Plead my case against an ungodly nation. O deliver me from the deceitful and unjust man. For you are the God of my strength. Why have you rejected me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? O send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill, to your dwelling places. Then I will go to the altar of God, to God, my exceeding joy. And upon the lyre I shall praise you, O God, my God. Why are you in despair, O my soul? Why are you disturbed within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, the help of my countenance and my God. Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful for your word. I want us to lay hold of the reality of what we have in our lap. You alone are the only God who speaks, and you have spoken in tremendous ways to your people. And Father, through your sovereignty and your power and your divine will, you have determined that we would have a copy from the things that you have said to your people that is passed down from generation after generation after generation after generation. And Father, we praise you for that. And Lord, we understand at least the beginnings of that understanding of just the treasure that we have. And Father, I pray that we would never take it for granted. We, that we'd understand that within this book that you have written contains the words of life. And we would treasure it all from cover to cover, Father, and that you would grant us the grace that we might understand it and that you would grant us the grace that we might walk in a way that honors it, that is a reflection of it, and that we would bring you glory as people who have been delivered from death to life, from the power of Satan to God, and we have been given a place among those who have been sanctified by faith in your Son, the Lord Jesus. Father, we don't know who wrote this. We don't even know the circumstances surrounding it. But it's better that way. And the reason I know it's better that way because that's the way that you give it to us. So, Father, help us through your Spirit to take my words and be found faithful to the text, useful to the body, and glorify you the entire way. And help your words bear fruit in our lives. Lord, we praise you and we love you. In Jesus' precious name, amen. If you have a chance or if you want a link, I can send it to you in, um, off of uh, YouTube. Uh, Steve actually preaches through both of those. And he was, I, I usually brag on Plumer, but I had watched Steve go through this. And Steve, Steve doesn't, he didn't go psalm to psalm to psalm. He hit on a few psalms along the way, some of the highlight or some of the grander, I guess. Psalms, if you can actually say that. And he spends more time on 42 and 43 than he does any other psalm that I know of. It's absolutely tremendous. So after I watched him a couple of times, I read Plumer and I was super disappointed in Plumer. Usually I'm not disappointed in Plumer. 
but you can tell that Steve has spent so much time in 42 and 43. Uh, when he finishes, you feel like he is so close to the original meaning that whoever wrote it wrote it yesterday. I mean, it just comes to you that way. So I'll be disappointed in how, I, how we go through this. I know by the end of it, but I do encourage you, if you want to do further study in 42 and 43, I can find Steve's link and send it to you. But anyway, he titles 42, Hope, obviously. That's the repeating refrain. And he entitles 43, Continued Hope. So it's about hope from beginning to end. But there are three distinct parts. And if you're taking notes, as I said, there are three laments that are brought together as one lament. You've got verses 1 through 4 as a lament. And that lament is answered by hope in verse 5. You've got 6 through 10 as the lament. It's answered by hope in verse 11. And then in 43, 1 through 4, you've got a lament that's answered with hope in verse 5. So you see the answer to our lament. It's always hope. And remember, this is biblical hope. It's different. Biblical hope is certainty. It's a matter of waiting. It's never the question of if. The question is always when, right? And so this is in regard to a biblical hope. So what I want to do, and I'll show you the progress as we go through, is just deal with each one of these sections individually, and then I'll show you some things as we go through. But you see, immediately begins in verse 1 and 2, describing a depth that you need to see right out, off, right out of the gate. When he begins, my soul, in verse 2, or verse 1, the second part of verse 1, and he begins verse 2 in the same way, my soul. So he's already driven us way down deeply just by using those words. This is not a circumstance in his life that is merely difficult. This is one that has shaken the foundation of who he is. But he knows where to go. We're not talking about an immature believer that's writing this. We're talking about a very mature believer. Yet even this mature believer makes tremendous progress as we move through this psalm. Because where does his soul want to go? He tells you, my soul pants for you, O God. So he knows where his answer lies. He knows where his comfort is. It's not in the escape of his circumstances. He begins right where he needs to end, and that is in the presence of God. In fact, he gives us three references. My soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. And then he asks the question, when shall I come and appear before God? Now, there's a whole lot of questions in here. And Steve does a good job in talking about the importance of questions. But you've got to ask the right question. Because his enemy is about to ask a question, and it is a very dangerous question. If you'll notice in verse 3, where is your God? Now, that's a terrible question. And he doesn't dwell on that question. But the enemy keeps repeating that question to him, and so that should clue you into that's a very dangerous question. You never ask the question, where is God? You know, as a believer, where God is. And so he doesn't linger there. He doesn't answer the question. He just wants you to know in the disparity of his soul, his enemy keeps provoking him by mocking him, saying, oh, where is your God? Where is your God now? Think about Christ on the cross. If you are the Son of God, right? Yeah, he, he will save you. It's a very similar way of describing, or a very similar way of asking that same question. Now, the, the question that comes in verse 2 is a good question. When shall I come and appear before God? That's a question of expectation. When do I get to come into your presence? When do I get to spend time with you? Right? That's a good question. That's an okay question. But Steve says this, and it's very true. At some point in time, you've got to stop asking questions, and you've got to start resting in promises. And as you study through this psalm, I want you to notice all the questions that are going through here. I think when, where, why. I don't think what is asked, but just a number of times. And like Steve reminds us, questions are fine. They're okay. But be very careful because you can't end there. You end with resting on the promises. Now, so when you look at verse 1 through 5, you'll notice what tense we're in. Look at verse 4. These things I remember. Now, where is he? 
if we were in a verb tense. Past, present, future. He's thinking about the past. So when we divide these psalms, if you want a, a subtitle for the first, I guess, five verses, the first section of this lament, faith is longing, L-O-N-G-I-N-G. Faith is longing. It's wanting to be in the presence of God, right? But he's, he's in the past. And there's something very dangerous about what he's doing in verse 4. What's so dangerous about that? Who do we know? Sarah's right. He's trying to lean on yesterday. 